So this chapter is on protists, and um, protists are a group of eukaryotes that uh, include, um, well, includes all the eukaryotes, and uh, it's not a, a monophyletic group, uh, but it's a, it's a group where uh, biologists have put all uh, eukaryotes that are hard to define in any of the other kingdoms, so it's kind of this... Uh, uh, sort, of, sort of a bin where we throw everything until you try to figure out uh, what types of organisms uh, each species is most closely related to. So looking at uh, the first section here, uh, the looking at the origins and uh, the concept of endosymbiosis, which has been mentioned before uh, in uh, your 1406 course and uh, in this course as well. Uh, endo means in, and symbiosis means uh, to live together. So your learning outcomes are to list and define features of eukaryotes. Uh, what makes them? Uh, we're familiar with these already. They have those membrane-bound organelles. Uh, the second one is to define endosymbiosis, and it explains how it relates to the evolution of our mitochondria and chloroplasts that we see in plants. And then describe how mitosis and fungi and some protists differ from uh, those that we see in uh, other eukaryotes, more specifically the kind you studied uh, as uh, a model for mitosis in your Biology 1 course. Uh, in our Biology 1 course, for example, we saw that mitosis, the nuclear envelope, uh, disintegrates or disappears during uh, the process of separating chromosomes. Uh, some groups show uh, that that doesn't occur. So, um, the eukaryotic cells do differ from prokaryotes. Uh, eukaryotic cells are going to have a cytoskeleton, uh, which is made of fibrous proteins in there, like uh, uh, those that make up the microtubules and the microfilaments, intermediate filaments. And then you also have membrane organelles that provide compartmentalization. So you can separate and do different things in, within the cell so you can compartmentalize aspects of your metabolism. The first, first eukaryotes, the definite fossils, like uh, this image here, uh, appeared in rocks about 1.5 billion years ago. So that sets a sort of a, a roundabout time in which we know for sure eukaryotes appeared uh, in the history of life on this planet. This diagram shows uh, parts of the process that may have occurred. Uh, and some of the supporting uh, evidence comes from the, the fact that we have uh, prokaryotic cells, which are bacteria that do have extensive infolding of their plasma membrane. So uh, one would imagine, how does a nucleus evolve uh, if you start off with cells that do not have them? Well, if you fold inwards uh, the plasma membrane, eventually that plasma membrane can fuse and form a compartment around your genetic uh, material, your chromosomes. And the next thing you know, you have uh, yourself a nuclear envelope. And then you have that folding still continued and uh, continuous with your uh, nuclear envelope. Uh, and that provides what we've uh, defined as our endomembrane system because the membranes are all connected. Now, uh, the hypothesis that your mitochondria and your your uh, chloroplast came from a once free living bacteria is called uh, endosymbiosis uh, and that means to live within uh, and so we know cells today do live inside other ones and many times when we see this it, it's uh, it's, a, it's a form of symbiosis called parasitism it may bring some harm onto the cell we see some bacteria that live inside uh, eukaryotic cells there's a protist we're going to study here in this chapter that uh, as part of their life cycle, they got to go inside uh, our cells and they, ca they cause disease. Uh, so we see endosymbiosis occurring, just not in a beneficial way. Here in this case, your mitochondria would have arisen from uh, an aerobic bacteria, just like the mitochondria use oxygen for, their met for the metabolism to generate ATP. And so a larger bacterium, perhaps one that is uh, starting to form an extensive endomembrane, uh, system engulfs an aerobic bacterium, and then uh, instead of digesting it down, they start uh, relying on each other over an extended period of time. And then next thing you know, you have a species in which uh, the mitochondria has now become inseparable and can no longer live as a free-living bacteria. And the chloroplasts, uh, the same idea, 
you've got a, a bacteria engulfs a photosynthetic bacterium, uh, just like in the lab, uh, perhaps a common ancestor to the cyanobacteria we see today. Uh, cyanos means blue-green, so these cyanobacteria. Uh, these are photosynthetic bacteria, uh, and they have a lot of the, the same metabolism that you see in a chloroplast. So the chloroplast that we see today uh, seem to come from uh, one event where endosymbiosis occurred. Uh, so um, while the hosts, that you'll see different photosynthetic organisms as we cover this chapter, uh, and they have chloroplasts, but the hosts themselves, the ones that actually have these uh, these chloroplasts, uh, they don't share, share ancestry, but that individual cyanobacterium does. And it'll make more sense when we see how that might happen. Brown algae, uh, which is also photosynthetic, uh, seems to have taken in another eukaryote that already had a chloroplast. So the evidence suggests, looking at and comparing uh, uh, the molecules of these organisms, the relationship suggests that a red algae, which already had a chloroplast in it when red algae was evolving, that another larger cell took in a red algae cell and the same thing, except the red algae was already a eukaryote. So the red algae had already gone through a primary endosymbiosis to take in that uh, uh, chloroplast or that uh, uh, cyanobacteria. And, and then here comes another cell and takes that one in. And the evidence from that comes from how many membranes the brown algae has around its uh, 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 chloroplast. Uh, a plant or a green algae, which is primary endosymbiosis, has two membranes, but the brown algae will have... Um, have uh, uh, three or four membranes around the, the chloroplast. So here's how uh, we have uh, a primary symbiosis, uh, endosymbiosis for an aerobic bacterium being taken in by a cell that already has a nucleus and some uh, uh, and membranes within there. Takes it in and then ends up living together. And so here's it now becomes a mitochondrion. And then so you already have this uh, a eukaryote that then later takes in a photosynthetic bacterium, a cyanobacterium, and now you have photosynthetic cells. So some of these cells, uh, way back when these events were occurring, some of these cells never took in a chloroplast and just go on to form to form uh, non-photosynthetic eukaryotes we see today. Uh, so that would be your primary endosymbiosis for both uh, your mitochondria and if you're photosynthetic chloroplast. But so uh, let's say we have now this event here where you have these uh, this line of cyanobacteria way back when this is occurring billions of years ago uh, goes in and uh, establishes this relationship and so you have a chloroplast with now with two membranes because of the endosymbiotic event and then here you have a large eukaryotic cell that's not photosynthetic at all and this photosynthetic cell has evolved to become a red algae now there's still red algae today but if you go back far enough in time you'll find some a relative of today's red algae that uh, the evidence suggests got taken in by a larger eukaryote. So you still have red algae alive today, but some of the relatives of the red algae that were existing back then got engulfed and then established a symbiotic relationship instead of being digested down. And that's what gave us brown algae. So here uh, you've got a chloroplast that has four membranes around it. So that's part of the evidence that would suggest this was a secondary uh, endosymbiosis. So there is other evidences for the endosymbiosis, the way these uh, structures, uh, um, where you get more of them is they, they replicate the way bacteria do. They go through binary fission. They also have their own circular DNA, both mitochondria, uh, and they're, they're also similar size. They're much smaller. They're smaller than the eukaryotic cell themselves. When it comes to uh, these uh, structures, the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, they also have their own ribosomes. And those ribosomes are smaller in the size and very similar to bacterial ribosomes. Uh, eukaryotic ribosomes uh, are larger. So that's uh, even more of supporting evidence there. Uh, and then again, like I mentioned, they do replicate uh, by binary fission just the way uh, we see bacteria do today. So when you, you look at the way um, uh, eukaryotes are going to divide and make more copies of themselves, we're going to have to have a new method of, cell div of, of division of cells that allows us to 
divide the nucleus, which is now more complex in a eukaryote. There's more genetic uh, material in there. There's a linear chromosome instead of circular chromosomes. And that process that evolved is called mitosis. So uh, mitosis did evolve in uh, eukaryotes. And, um, um, and like I mentioned earlier, they do have multiple chromosomes. So that process of mitosis and then cell division, the full cell dividing is called cytokinesis. Um, uh, is was a necessary step in the evolution of eukaryotes. So we're going to be overviewing uh, protists here, and uh, your learning outcomes for this section include to describe how an organism would be classified as a protist, and then recognize the six supergroups, which have already been mentioned in a prior chapter, uh, where we find protists, they're all eukaryotes, and then list two major reasons, uh, two major means of locomotion used by protists. Uh, there are more than two, but uh, uh, how they move about. Uh, so when we look at protists, uh, and if we were to call protists the kingdom, the kingdom protista, it's a very diverse uh, group uh, here. And the only thing that really brings them all together is these are eukaryotes. Uh, and they're eukaryotes that are not easily classified in the kingdom fungi, the kingdom plantae, and the kingdom animalia. They just don't quite fit well within those groups when we look at the, our formal classification and our taxonomy. And so we're going to need a different way of handling um, this diversity we see. And, and in fact, it, it seems that when you look at protists, they're just simpler uh, uh, organisms in some in some ways they share ancestry with members from other kingdoms so the idea of plates becomes more important uh, if we're trying to discuss then uh, where we actually classify them uh, so this was issues and problems we talked about with classification back in chapter 23 uh, when we started this uh, this uh, semester this session uh, for the course so they do uh, vary uh, considerably um, in every aspect. Some of them are going to be unicellular. Some are going to live in colonies, and some are going to have some multicellular. So they're a simple multicellular. So when we go multicellular, it's not just a colony of the same kind of cells. It's more than at least two or more cell types. Uh, most are going to be microscopic, but some, like algae, are going to be macroscopic and huge. They're going to have all kinds of symmetry. And we're going to see all kinds of nutrition, like uh, photoautotrophic, uh, uh, chemoheterotrophic, and so on. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, the only thing that ties the group together, if we call them protists, if we already refer to them as a kingdom, they're not going to be monophyletic. The, the members in that group just don't easily fit in those other kingdoms. Uh, so uh, as a group, if we say kingdom protista, it's not monophyletic. And so in order to handle that diversity, we talked about uh, earlier already, these six supergroups. Uh, and you want to make sure that you can um, list these from memory uh, and then have some idea of what kinds of, uh, of representatives go in each group. With, and uh, being in those groups would, would suggest some sort of uh, uh, evolutionary relationships. Uh, these are going to be covered both in the lab and in the lab you need to be able to tell me um, if we're going to talk about animals. Animals belong to the supergroup of Pistocanta. Okay, so uh, this is more like what we saw earlier except they threw in a few pictures here. This shows uh, an overall history uh, or the relationships among the organisms. Here you see the prokaryotes out here and that's a major division. These represent those two domains and then we have the domain all the way up here, the eukaryota. Uh, and shows the relationships. And these are the six supergroups, the excavata, the chromalveolata, the rhizaria, the archaeplastida, which means ancient uh, chloroplast, uh, reference to that, and then the amoebozoa, and then the opistocanta, which includes the fungi uh, and the animalia and some protists that uh, are still alive today called coanoflagellates. Uh, and these guys have special cell types that... Uh, are seen in some of the simplest animals, and so there, uh, there is a suggestion there that's just structurally with the cells that, uh, you, that they're going to share some recent common ancestry. Remember when we go back in this diagram here, keep in mind we're going back 
millions, billions of years. We're going back in time as we go down this cladogram here. Now, within these supergroups, we're going to have these subgroups, and the and the basically this chapter is going to go supergroup by supergroup and describe some of these representatives. And one thing is important to to think about here is that while many of these protists belong to these supergroups, uh, within some of these supergroups, you're going to see multicellularity. For example, the land plants right here, and they share kinship with red algae and green algae. Out here, the fungi are multicellular, and the animalia are are multicellular. And, and here's the big point: here is that multicellularity has arisen in uh, through evolutionary history independently in these different groups. In other words, if we go back far enough in time, you start off with these simple single-cell eukaryotes, and then they some of them start evolving to be colonial, and then simple multicellular, and then you have these multicellular groups arising independently of each other, which is something we talked about when we were considering um, systematics in, in 23, chapter 23. Now, uh, the cell surfaces of protists do vary, uh, and you find, uh, 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 you may find some different uh, structural features on the surface of these, but they're all going to have a plasma membrane for sure. Many of them do produce an extracellular matrix, or ECM, uh, for example, we're going to look at these uh, uh, kind of uh, photosynthetic group called diatoms, and they make uh, uh, a little uh, like a cell wall type structure or a, silica, uh, or a silica shell. And silica or silicate is the same material that you, you, you can use to make glass. So they have glass shells. Uh, some of them do produce cysts that allow them to remain dormant when times are, are not good. Uh, and in some cases... Um, uh, these uh, structures may be used to transmit uh, organisms that can, can cause disease. So if these are single-celled organisms, they're going to be living, for the most part, in water, very moist, moist situations. When things dry up in their environment, uh, they're going to form this protective cyst around there that can have them allow them to weather the bad time until water comes back in again. Uh, as far as locomotion goes, uh, the protists themselves, we're looking at single and simple organisms, uh, have a variety of ways of doing it. That first uh, video that we see there uh, shows organisms that use the flagella. They also have this odd movement. A flagella is uh, just like flagella you see in the sperm, uh, but the particular one there on the uh, video you see playing on the right are in a group called the uh, euglenoids, and they they have they also move their cytoplasm around. Uh, but you can see the little flagella moving uh, out there uh, in front of it pulling it through the, the water. Uh, others are going to use uh, cilia, like you're going to see in the video there. These are paramecia. The cilia are like fine little versions of flagella, but they're usually numerous. And they beat in a coordinated fashion. Uh, and cilia is not unique to these protists. We have cilia in some of our tissues, for example, lining uh, the inside of our respiratory tract. So we have these uh, types of structures here. Uh, you can kind of make out the little beating hair-like structures. Uh, overall, and uh, they're used to move around. And then you have pseudopodia. Uh, every biology student, uh, including us here, should know what pseudopodia are. Uh, and it stands, pseudo means false, and then pod means foot, so these are false feet. Uh, and this is the way amoebas move, and that's the way white blood cells uh, that help protect us against invading bacteria move through our tissues to help uh, protect. They move through this uh, this uh, false, these extensions of their cytoplasm. We'll get a look at that uh, amoeboid motion, uh, motion with the pseudopodia in a bit. For nutrition in protists, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's going to be autotrophs. They make their own food. Many are going to be photoautotrophs. Some are going to be chemoautotrophs. Now, these are modes of nutrition we already mentioned uh, when we studied the chapter on bacteria. So make sure you know uh, some of the nuance. Uh, there's some uh, differences uh, beyond just uh, being a, a photoautotroph and a heterotroph. There's others there as well, photolithoautotrophs that we mentioned in those prior that prior chapter on bacteria. So make sure you go and review uh, that. When it comes to heterotrophs here, uh, heterotrophs are going to rely on uh, organic uh, uh, molecules that are usually produced by other organisms. Uh, and many are going to ingest the food, do a, sort of a cellular ingestion called uh, 
of phagocytosis, which you study in the cell chapter in bio one, uh, and we may call them phagotrophs, it's just the way they eat. And then some are mixotrophs, uh, yeah, like the euglena we saw before. It turns out that that larger group of euglena, maybe 30% uh, uh, of them or so are capable of photosynthesis because they develop this uh, endosymbiotic relationship with, uh, and uh, in order to get their chloroplasts, as we mentioned in the prior section, uh, and then some of them, they're, and they're all related when you look at them uh, and you compare their DNA and so on. Uh, some of them didn't, and they're just purely heterotrophic. But the ones that develop that relationship uh, with uh, to gain the chloroplast are capable of doing both. So they're referred to as mixotrophs. So they're both animal and plant-like. Uh, for reproduction and protists, uh, many of them, uh, the, they're all going to show a form of asexual reproduction, and that's just cell division here. Um, and it's a typical mode of division there, so um, the euglena would just divide the nucleus and then divide the cell. Uh, so that would be mitosis is division of the nucleus, and that's one form. And, and so mitosis technically is division of the nucleus, so you're going to have that occur in all of these. So... When we talk about uh, a kind of cell division, we have to talk about uh, what kind of cytokinesis is going to occur here. So uh, your cytokinesis would be where you get two equal daughter cells. So be careful here. It's a little bit confusing there. Mitosis is the division of the nucleus. So that has to occur if we're going to make new cells regardless. Budding is going to be a form of cytokinesis. Mitosis has to happen, right, because the nucleus divide. It's going to be a kind of cytokinesis in which of the two daughter cells that are produced from this event, one of them is going to be smaller. It's almost like a little cell buds off the larger one, and then it has to grow uh, to be a big cell, right? And then there is a schizogony here. And here, this is going to be cell division, where the cell itself divides. The cytokinesis is going to divide only after the nucleus is divided uh, um, uh, several times. So the nucleus divides and then houses the several nuclei, and then the... the the cell divides uh, uh, to produce the several individuals. And then there's sexual reproduction that we see even in single cell, these single celled organisms, they manage to figure out a way how to combine uh, a set of chromosomes from two different parent cells. Uh, and so, in order to do this, another kind of special nuclear division needed to evolve meiosis. And so, meiosis was a topic that was uh, discussed in some detail in your Biology 1 course. So one big thing, idea you need to recall from there is that in order to combine genetic material from two different parents, you need to first reduce the number of chromosomes by half. So you start off with uh, a cell that is diploid, and then that cell goes through two divisions during meiosis, not one. And that first division actually reduces uh, to a cell that has two haploids, to two cells that have two haploids. However, the sister chromatids are still combined, so you're going to need that one more division. Okay? And you're just dividing the, the, the exact copies of the chromosome uh, here, and they're still going to be haploid. But during this process, and the significance here is that there are a couple of events that occur that uh, create these cells, these four cells that are now have half the, the number of chromosomes that are going to become sperm cells or egg cells. They have half the number of chromosomes, but the chromosomes that are within there are different combinations of what was in this uh, parent cell here. And that cell has two sets of chromosomes that came from the generation before. So what meiosis is doing here is uh, recombining uh, genes from uh, the parent overall, and that creates this variation in the gametes, and then that, uh, and then when the other parent makes its gametes, uh, the when the two combined, you're going to get offspring that have uh, that are variable. So this promotes genetic uh, um, this promotes genetic recombination, which promotes uh, genetic variation, and that's pretty important. Uh, so you want to have genetic variation in your population. So if the environment changes, you have individuals that uh, uh, may still be able to withstand those changes within the environment. Uh, when we have the haploid gametes uh, produced during fertilization, uh, then you recombine 
and you get back your diploid number. Now, there's different kinds of life histories or life cycles, and we're going to be seeing those as we study uh, biodiversity in these uh, upcoming chapters. So again, what is the advantage of sexual reproduction? You're going to get genetic variation, uh, and that's done through this uh, through uh, uh, two things that happen during meiosis, genetic variation. First of all, you have pairs of chromosomes. They come in two sets, so you have two pairs. And the chromosomes, you get one from one parent, one from the other uh, for each pair. They line up independent of each other during meiosis one on the metaphase plate. So the, when they line up independent, uh, one parent uh, from one, chromosome from one, they can line up on uh, one side or the other and then on uh, the other side. If we relate that to humans, humans have 23 pairs and each pair, one came from mom, one came from dad. Uh, and it could be paternal, maternal, or vice versa on the metaphase plate. And then it's the same for the next pair and so on. So for humans, that gives you 8 million possible combinations alone. And then another event occurs during meiosis one called crossing over. And that further mixes, uh, uh, recombines uh, pieces of chromosomes themselves, giving us uh, um, a lot more uh, recombination. So more, even much more variation in those gametes. So... Um, protists do uh, show, as I mentioned earlier, multicellularity evolved in several lines of these organisms. And so significance for multicellularity is that uh, uh, it allows for specialization within those within the body of the organism so that you divide the labor up to cells that specialize to do things that benefit the overall uh, multicellular organism. And as I mentioned earlier, this multicellularity arose multiple times in the evolutionary history of of uh, these different groups of eukaryotes, right? So uh, that's significant because uh, now you have organisms that can take advantage and evolve uh, in this in the environments here on Earth in uh, new ways and opens lines of new new lines of uh, evolution. So in this group, we're gonna or in this section, we're gonna look at the uh, the supergroup called Excavata which is here in our diagram there, and it includes three uh, subgroups here, the diplomonads, the parabasalids, and uh, uh, the glenozoa. And uh, so in this group here, uh, for this group, in your learning objectives for uh, our outcomes for this one include to list the main features of diplomonads and parabasalids, uh, which are excavates. We, we can call them more simple. Uh, more simply uh, or informally, I should say, uh, and then give examples of diplomonads and parabasalids, which we'll see some of those, and then explain why euglenozoa cannot be classified as either plant or animal. Those are the ones that I was mentioning in the prior section, they're mixotrophs. And then describe um, the distinguishing features of kinetoplastids. So we're going to see uh, these groups there. Kinetoplastid is actually a, a uh, subgroup of the euglenozoa. Uh, so uh, we, we're going to go in order here, diplomonads, parabasalids, right? So uh, the group consists of uh, those three major groups. So, like I said, the euglenozoa is going to be separated into uh, euglenas and then kinetoplastids. Um, the euglenas are going to be like the one that we saw that was moving in the prior section. That was that little video segment. It has a flagella, but the body changes shape. It looks like it's, uh, well, it's called a euglenoid motion. Now, these, these, this group over here does uh, share similarities in their cytoskeletal features of their cytoskeleton and DNA sequences, which is why these uh, subgroups are put together in the excavata. So looking at the first group, the diplomonads here, they're unicellular, uh, and they have multiple flagella, just like we see in this image here. This is a scanning electron micrograph. They color enhanced it. You can see the several flagella there. If this was a light, uh, uh, an image of light microscopy, uh, you would actually see two nuclei, one here and one here. Uh, and so what's characteristic of diplomonads, uh, and one way you might remember that is diplo, is that they have uh, two nuclei. Now, the organism that you see on the right is called giardia. Uh, and Giardia is an intestinal parasite, and, and, and uh, we can get it from contaminated water. It's, it's a human or animal parasite, uh, and it, it uh, latches onto the inside walls of your intestine and causes problems with absorbing fats, and you end up with diarrhea, and it has to be treated with special anti-parasitic uh, drugs. Uh, 
and um, uh, so it, it, it is an important parasite. I actually did a term paper on this one uh, in parasitology, so uh, it's uh, really a fascinating organism. Uh, what's interesting here is that they do lack functional mitochondria, so this is something we see here. This is also going to be true uh, uh, as, as we look. There's going to be some some uh, modification on the mitochondria and here, a lack of uh, functional mitochondria. So one might ask, well, how does it go about cell respiration? That's a, a, a really important or, or, or question that uh, you could do a little bit of research on, but let's just go ahead and move on here. Uh, big idea here, two nuclei, multiple flagella for diplomonads, uh, and they lack functional mitochondria. And then uh, representative is Giardia, which is intestinal parasite. Now for the parabasalids here, uh, they're also going to have two nuclei, which is not listed here on this uh, slide, but your textbook will help, would help fill in some of this information here. Uh, so so uh, there's a variety of places that you might find these. They're, you know, simple single-celled organisms here. Uh, you can see some flagella here and this undulating membrane uh, that they have there. Some of them are going to live in the guts of termites. And the, so they have this symbiotic relationship are associated with the cellulose-degrading enzymes that uh, bacteria produce. Uh, so uh, they're taking advantage uh, or, or establish a relationship with bacteria that are found in that gut. And then we have uh, another one called Trichomonas vaginalis. And so this the scientific name here, the specific epithet, gives you an idea of where uh, we might find this when it is an STD or STI, sexually transmitted infection, that can cause disease. Um, like I said, they do have flagella and this undulating or waving membrane that helps them move. Uh, and here, a little step up, the, the mitochondria is semi-functional, unlike the diplomonads, it was non-functional. And then the euglenozoa, uh, which we saw an image of one uh, moving through the, or video of moving through the, through the water there. Um, so the bodies of these can change shape when they're swimming. We saw that, so we can uh, visualize that here. So they alternate between stretching out and moving. The the flagella also tends to pull, help pull the organs into the water rather than push. So it's more ants on the anterior side in the front of it rather than the posterior, uh, anterior like antes. Uh, and so uh, they can ch they change shape. They lack a cell wall, but they do have this uh, uh, special covering around the, them. Uh, uh, that is that is very flexible, so a protein uh, uh, extracellular matrix, um, and so these are among some of the earliest eukaryotes to uh, possess mitochondria. Uh, and the, like I said uh, a while ago in the in the last uh, uh, at the beginning of the section here, this group includes free living euglenids and the parasitic kinetoplastids. So. Uh, what ties the euglenids together, like the one we saw in the video with the flagella moving around and it was green because they had chloroplasts. They're free living. They don't live with other organisms. And then here we have a symbiotic relationship that's harmful, the kinetoplastids. So looking at the free living euglenids, I mentioned earlier uh, that the chloroplast uh, is uh, uh, just like the other chloroplasts, uh, is through a symbiotic event here. Only about a third of the euglenids um, that are free living have chloroplasts. So it seems that one line or a line of euglenids, when they were evolving early on, none of them had chloroplasts. But then they ingested uh, a, um, uh, a uh, cyanobacterium and brought that in. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, Actually, it was the cyanobacterium. So we, we go down here. The uh, it was an algae, so this would be secondary into symbiosis. The algae was already uh, possessed a chloroplast. So you go, you go the the initial into symbiosis to make the algae, the green algae, and then another eukaryote ingests that to uh, produce these uh, euglenids, where a third of them have the ability to uh, produce their own food with the help of light energy. They, the reproduction is asexual, uh, and it occurs by mitosis. Uh, the euglena have two anterior in the front, uh, so these would help pull the organism through the water. Uh, flagella, One, the, they arise out of this area here at the front, so this in this diagram here, you can see one of the flagella coming out. They're in this area up in here uh, that's uh, 
referred to as a reservoir. The other, the other flagella is uh, very short and doesn't actually extend outside the body of the cell. They have contractile vacuoles, which help them pump out. They contract and pump out excess of water. If these live in fresh water, they're going to be taking in water by osmosis. And in order to keep that water balanced so this organism doesn't have too much water in there and, and risk uh, bursting open that uh, we need to contract our vacuoles. Uh, they're also going to have a special spot here uh, referred to as a stigma. Uh, and uh, this stigma is light sensitive, so this is going to allow to help guide them um, towards uh, light if uh, photosynthesis is uh, going to be important for them. Um, so this uh, diagram is just showing some scientific thinking. Uh, they, they have these little uh, side uh, notes here to show how science is a process. And all they did was they just exposed, uh, if you read through it, they exposed euglena, uh, some to light and then some without light. And it shows that uh, over time, those that were in the dark, uh, their, uh, their, uh, mito their chloroplasts become very reduced. Uh, and then when you re-expose them to light, they begin to uh, uh, show uh, more active uh, chloroplasts. And then uh, we have the parasitic kinetoplastids. And so um, this is a, a subgroup within the euglena zoa. So these guys are going to have, uh, or this group is going to have, subgroup is going to have uh, flagella as well. They have a single uni unique mitochondrion. And this mitochondrion is, uh, is modified considerably. And uh, it's called a kinetoplastid because kinesis means, and this is not on the slide uh, here, but if you, if you read through the text, the uh, mitochondrion, it was found to be mitochondrion, but initially they thought it had something to do with uh, movement of the flagella uh, rather than function as a mitochondria. So it was involved in the movement in kinesis, uh, like in the study of, uh, uh, called kinesiology, the study of movement of the body or kinematics and physics movement. Uh, that's what gave that structure its name early on. It still has that name, but it's a modified uh, single mitochondrion. The mitochondrion itself is, um, is a bit larger and it has uh, several round uh, or circular DNA in there. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's associated with uh, some rapid aspect of the metabolism that uh, that the mitochond that the, the this group has now, this group has several important human uh, parasites. So again, the kinetoplastids are all parasitic of animals, but some of the ones found in, in humans include a group called the trypanosomes. So it's, it's a, that's like a family of of them, uh, and some of them cause African sleeping sickness. Another one causes leishmaniasis. Uh, and then one called Chagas disease. The ones that cause the African sleeping sickness and, and Chagas disease belong to a genus called Trypanosoma. And uh, that's a genus that so should be underlined when you write it uh, or italicize if you type it out. Leishmaniasis is caused by uh, a, a close relative in the same family, but it's a different genus, uh, uh, Leishmania or something like that. Now, uh, Chagas disease is found here in the Americas, in tropical Americas, and it's transmitted by what's called the kissing bug. This is a, 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 um, a uh, an order of insects that, that include uh, stink bugs, the chinches, and, and then these guys, these are called assassin bugs. And they have a sharp beak that they use to pierce uh, for a stink bug, like we call them chinches around here when they... They, they pierce the plant tissue and then draw out sap for their nutrition. These guys here uh, will attack other insects and other animals. And in this case, these will come and bite humans. And they're carrying uh, the trypanosoma that causes Chagas disease. Uh, and there's a video here that you can watch uh, on your own uh, that's in there. You'll, you can play it by uh, pushing on it and it'll start to play. And it shows how it gets into cells and causes damage uh, over time, uh, called Chagas disease. African CP sickness caused by another trypanosome um, uh, is found in, in, it was called African CP sickness. It causes different uh, symptoms. And so, uh, So uh, looking at the one that causes African seedling sickness, the vector, with the, 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 uh, the insect that is the vector, and the other one for Chagas disease, uh, 
it uh, transmits um, uh, trypanosoma cruzi is the name of that uh, trypanosome. This one is called the CT fly, and this one uh, transmits uh, the trypanosoma that causes African CP sickness. And here you can see this is a blood sample of an individual that's infected with them. And you can see the trypanosome there. You can see the flagella there. They have this as an undulating membrane. And these are red blood cells right here. Uh, and this one is rather interesting, the trypanosomes, because they have the ability to evade the host immune system, like if the human is the host for this. There's wild animals that also can carry this, but they are uh, they must have evolved with this uh, for much longer, and so they don't quite get, show the, the the kind of disease that you would see that a human would get uh, overall. But these trypanosomes have this ability to change their surface proteins, uh, and um, it's called the VSG for variable surface glycoproteins. They have a gene for those uh, glycoproteins, but whenever it comes to transcribing and translating them, they're able to create as many as a thousand different versions of that protein. And so that ends up confusing the immune system uh, and it makes it incredibly hard to make vaccines for them. Uh, so when they look back at the three, those three um, major kinetoplastids that cause leishmaniasis, uh, Chagas disease, and uh, um, uh, leishmaniasis, uh, leishmaniasis they uh, they seem to have uh, some common uh, some common genes in those three, and that provides a target where they might uh, look at uh, research on how uh, those common genes can allow for the development of, of drugs to treat uh, uh, this disease. So now we're going to look at the supergroup Chromalveolata, and for this group here, it's it's there's uh, many subgroups here, and they're broken up into uh, into two major clades, the alveolates and the stromanopila, or the stromanopiles. And then we have several subgroups here. Uh, in some cases, they totally relate to um, a phylum uh, within this group here. Now, uh, some of these guys in here do have uh, the ability to photosynthesize uh, within this group. So, uh, in, in these cases, it's secondary endosymbiosis, so the chloroplasts would have evidence for this with four membranes around them. So looking at the learning outcomes for this one here, you want to make sure that you can identify some distinguishing features of the alveolates, uh, which is one of the subgroups of the chromalveolata. Uh, and then explain the function of the apical complex and ap apicomplexins. Apicomplexins are the second group right here, this uh, of the alveolates there. And then describe the characteristic features of the stromenopiles. The stromenopiles is this uh, second subclade here uh, within the chromalveolata. And then explain how oomycetes are distinguished from other protists. Uh, the oomycetes are a group within the stromenopiles, uh, and uh, they used to be uh, grouped with fungi. Mycetes is uh, the root from there means fungus, uh, yeah, so I've got a Greek origin to it. So looking at the alveolates, um, the alveolates are, get their name because uh, at the at the at the plasma membrane they have these little sac-like structures. In fact, uh, alveolus means uh, sac, so they have little sac-like structures there. And as you can see, uh, this uh, sac-like structure, this is an electron micrograph here, and you can see the alveolus or the sac-like structure there. Uh, and in this case, it may be uh, containing a special organelle. Uh, like within the AP complexins, they have this organelle called an apical complex uh, that's associated with their ability to um, get into a host cell. The, the AP complexins are parasitic, uh, all of them. Uh, so that's a subgroup within the alveolates. Um, there's the dinoflagellates as well, the ciliates. Um, uh, now, they do have a common lineage, so they are thought to all be as a monophyletic group. Uh, but they do have diverse modes of lo uh, locomotion and how they move around. So look, the point here is that being able to move and characterizing them by the way they move was not a good uh, way to classify them. And so an old classification scheme might have uh, done that initially. But when with modern analysis, looking at uh, uh, DNA and other molecular structures within these cells shows that these this group Stanoflagellates, AP complex ciliates show this common uh, ancestry. 
then the straminopiles uh, here include the brown algae, which is a phylum, the diatoms, and then the oomycetes, which sometimes they call them water molds, even though they're uh, technically not considered a... Uh, a, uh, a, fun, a fungus. Now, one of the things that these have in common, and we'll see some images of this here, just like we do here. This is an electron micrograph showing uh, where this group gets its name from. This is part of the flagellum coming off of the body of the cell of the organism, and it has these little structure, uh, these little straw-like structures, piles. Uh, in fact, as a reference to that, uh, roughly translated, it means a straw or hair-like structures here. So their flagella have this unique uh, thing. And so you'll see this in some of the drawings when you look at the life cycle of brown algae. When they produce a cell that has a flagella, you'll see this little instrumental pile-like uh, structures on there. Uh, so uh, that's uh, where the name uh, for this group comes from. Now, uh, you can have what we were calling evolutionary reversals. So... Uh, some members in this group don't display that characteristic anymore, and so that would be interpreted as because they do share so many other characteristics that they're put together, why don't they have the hair-like structures on the flagellus? Because through evolution you can lose structures, uh, just like uh, whales and snakes lost their, their appendages, lost their legs. Uh, so uh, looking at the dinoflagellates, uh, uh, these are alveolates. These guys uh, are photosynthetic, uh, so they're considered uh, would be con could be considered algae because they're uh, simple protists that live in in uh, in, uh, uh, in aquatic uh, habitats like the the sea that you see in this image here. Uh, and they get their name from uh, the fact that they have two flagella. So you can see every one of these. Uh, well. Uh, you can kind of see it, but they have uh, this uh, these plates that are made of cellulose, which is the same stuff in the cell walls of uh, of um, of a uh, of a plant cell, a cell wall. So these are made of cellulose. Uh, so they're cellulose plates, uh, and they they may be in several parts. And these these cellulose plates have a groove in there, and in one of the grooves there's a flagella that uh, circles around the, the body of the cell, the cell body. And then they have another flagella here. That uh, flagella that goes around the cell uh, itself actually causes a spinning motion, and so that's where the name comes from. Dinos can be interpreted to mean to spin. Uh, so these dinoflagellates have this spinning type motion, and so when you see video of them or you look at live ones under the microscope, you'll see them spinning there. Uh, now, they are photosynthetic unicellular. Uh, again, they live in aquatic habitats, and some of them have the ability to bioluminesce. So I kind of searched around looking for an image here. And a lot of times when the waves disturb the water, uh, that energy in there kind of uh, stimulates these uh, cells to produce uh, light through uh, enzymatic reactions that they have here. So bioluminescence is something you see in many things, uh, the familiar fireflies or the light bugs that uh, we see. Uh, I just saw some recently, uh, last week, I think, when I was out outdoors at night. But you can see here, here's the water below the line I'm drawing there, and then uh, you can see some trees along the, the shoreline there. And then you can see the, the water's lit up there. That's, that's Those are dinoflagellates that are capable of bioluminescing. Um, this group has some peculiarities here. It doesn't seem to be related to any other phyla, uh, phylum and uh, one of the issues here is that their DNA does not have a complex with the histones. What we were talking about in your Biology 1 course about how DNA in eukaryotes is organized because there's a lot of DNA in eukaryotes and they're linear, they're not circular. Uh, histones is a protein that helps to organize your DNA into chromatin. Uh, and uh, there doesn't seem to be much of these complexes seen in this group. So that's uh, a unique peculiarity that requires some uh, understanding how did that how, how do we get that uh, in these eukaryotes and so for uh, the dinoflagellates um, most of them are going to have chloro like you, your green plants on land have chlorophyll a and b uh, the dinoflagellates have chloro chlorophyll a and c and another pigments called carotenoids which will give a yellowish or orange color to them uh, so their biochemistry is going to resemble uh, that of diatoms, which we haven't seen just yet, and the brown algae, which is coming up uh, here in a little bit. Uh, they do primarily reproduce by asexual reproduction. That would just be a, a, a cell division. Uh, they do exhibit sexual reproduction, and that means they're going to have to go through a meiosis uh, type of division. 
Uh, but this is only under stressful conditions uh, in a case when perhaps uh, there's not enough nutrients in the water for them. They are also responsible for uh, red tides and uh, the uh, um, there's a video here that uh, they talk about uh, this, and uh, I'll, I'll have that video. You can download this and watch it, but they'll talk about how red tide does affect the environment because they produce toxins that can affect the nervous system of animals. And uh, there's uh, some of the imagery that's in there. Besides, it's about a three-minute video. They, uh, if you download it and start the presentation, you can look at the video or go to this website that's right here. Uh, but they also have some uh, images within the video that shows how the water gets changed to different color. Now, the toxins produced can actually harm human health and they cause can cause big fish kills, uh, uh, kill off uh, marine birds and mammals as well. Uh, so the video go, go, goes through that. It's uh, about a three minute video. It's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. So we're gonna move on though. So looking at the AP complexins here, and these are still the alveolates within the larger group called chromalveolata. Now, these are sometimes referred to as spore forming. We talked about how some of them will form these uh, spores or cysts that uh, in, in many cases may help transmit to another host. These are all animal parasites. And they get their name because uh, within the alveolar sac, they have uh, uh, an organelle called an apical complex. And this organelle actually assists in them invading the host cell. Uh, the parasite belongs to this group of protists that causes malaria, and it belongs to the genus Plasmodium. That's why it's italicized and capitalized, so you know it's a genus when you see it in the context of biology. Uh, when you look at it, it's got to be a genus. There's many species of Plasmodium that uh, can cause the disease. Plasmodium uh, vivax is one of them. They do have a complex life cycle that involves both sexual, asexual, and different hosts. I'll show you the life cycle that's in your book here. Uh, but the actual life cycle is even more complex than what we're seeing there, so keep that in mind. Um, you can search the web and find the Center for Disease Control. They have the actual life cycle that shows how it's even more complex than that, but it involves a mosquito as a vector. Uh, so the mosquito is the vector and the mosquitoes, uh, one of the mosquitoes uh, that I know uh, is a vector for it belongs to the genus called Anopheles. Uh, so you may see that mentioned there and I'm gonna underline that because I can't write it in italics. So that's the way you would write a genus appropriately. Now, um, malaria is a serious human uh, disease. And so, um, the idea is uh, uh, human health is very important, so uh, there's ways to do this, try to develop a vaccine uh, or drugs to treat the illness itself, uh, try to prevent the infection, uh, and even pesticides to get rid of the mosquito populations. However, uh, pesticides have a way of getting in food chains, and so that's been the case for DDT. DDT has caused a lot of environmental problems. They still use it around the world in Probably chances are you probably have it within your body from eating certain fruits and other things uh, that the residues get on. Uh, not to any significant toxic levels, but uh, this has created some massive environmental problems and it has a very long environmental life before it breaks down. But anyway, here's a problem. Uh, life finds a way, like in uh, the, that uh, famous line in the old Jurassic Park movie. Uh, eventually, there's going to be some variation within a population where this pesticide doesn't really affect an individual because it's carrying some uh, variable trait, perhaps through a mutation or through some new recombination of genes from prior generations that just allows it to metabolize this toxin in a way that makes it less toxic. And they survive and then they produce these uh, insects or these population mosquitoes that's become resistant to that. Same thing happens with bacteria with antibiotics. So that's going to be, it's always a constant battle. So here's the life cycle of the mosquito and it does involve sexual and asexual and also involves uh, another thing that you're going to hear me mention quite often uh, is uh, differentiation. Sometimes when cells divide here, they're going to have all the same chromosomes. They're genetically similar but you're gonna flip on a different set of genes that uh, are within the nucleus. And whenever you turn on a different set of genes, you have a cell that behaves differently and differentiates. This is how 
all of the cells in their body, there's over 200 different cell types, about 250, but they all are genetically identical, except the uh, sperm cells or egg cells uh, when those are produced. But all the other body cells, the somatic cells, they call them. Soma means body. They're all genetically identical. So how do you get a muscle cell? How do you get a skin cell? How do you get uh, the cells that are sensitive to light in your eye? The answer is differentiation. So we're going to see differentiation in this life cycle. Uh, and that involves, usually involves, it could involve a cell division and then cell division and differentiation. And then you also have to, so that involves mitosis. But then you're going to have to see meiosis occur at some point if there's sexual reproduction. And that's going to be a key theme you see when we look at life cycles of organisms that have sexual reproduction. This is true for plants, for fungi, for animals, and these protists here. It's true for the mosquito. So this is your mosquito. This is uh, Anopheles here. And if we start right here. You have a, a mosquito uh, that is carrying uh, a stage in the life cycle called sporozoite. And uh, the sporozoite is going to be uh, developed within the salivary glands of the mosquito. So the mosquito bites, the sporozoites uh, come out into the, the tissue of uh, the human or whatever animal it's biting. And then they move around the body, circulate around the body, and they'll end up in an organ like the liver and then penetrate into the liver cell and then go through uh, division and differentiation to form another stage in their life cycle called the merozoite. And within the merozoite, they enter red blood cells and they reproduce within the red blood cells and then they break out. And when they break out, they release these toxins that create these periodic fevers and other symptoms of the disease and malaria. And then they enter new blood cells that haven't been infected and continue that cycle over and over again of just mitosis, uh, uh, reproduction within the cell by asexual reproduction. At some point, some of these merozoites, though, are going to go through a differentiation and they're going to change and they're going to turn into a gametocyte, right? And so when they go and become a gametocyte, they are going, these are going to be cells, they're not gametes yet, gametes are sex cells. These are going to be cells that are going to go through that special division, meiosis. So they're going to go, so right now, um, uh, they're, well, they, they're not going to go through meiosis. I, I back up, I, I, they're already haploid. The, the thing that they're going to do is not go through meiosis. These guys right here are already haploid. Okay, so I uh, caught myself going down the wrong path on this explanation. So make sure you correct that. The, all the cells here in these stages here are all haploid, one end, one set of chromosomes. They've just differentiated. They went through a division. Uh, they're going to go through a division, and then they're going to enter the blood uh, as a mosquito that's not carrying any plasmodium at all. They're not carrying any of this parasite at all. They're going to get into the gut of the of the mosquito as the mosquito is taking the blood meal, and as they get into the, the blood meal, uh, eventually they're going to go through a division and differentiation to form gametes. And is the division is just going to be mitosis and differentiation, no meiosis. They're already haploid. We can't reduce the number of chromosomes any further. So mitosis. So, so make sure you're aware of that when I when I was when I was starting to go down the wrong path of explanation because I was uh, just not thinking very clearly right now. Uh, uh, honestly, I'm making this video a little bit late at night, but no excuses. We make mistakes. I make mistakes too sometimes. So uh, a lot of times, actually. So uh, that's that's normal. So uh, here, the two gametes, uh, they're two different cell types. They combine. And when they do, that's your fertilization. So that's going to be, now we recombine uh, to diploid, but that doesn't last very long. Okay, We're going to form this oocyst, and within there, that's where meiosis is going to occur. And so what happens here is that you produce these sporozoites, and this is now occurring in the salivary glands, and the, where the, the fluids are produced by the mosquito, and uh, they become these mature sporozoites that now get transmitted into the next uh, victim that gets bitten by it. And it says mammal here, and humans are mammals, so we are a host for the malarial parasite. So it is a complex life cycle is a big point here. Uh, then there's another group um, called the Gregorines. These are also parasites of other animals, not mammals. These are of uh, parasites of mammals are a kind of vertebrate. These are invertebrate parasites. Invertebrates are a big group of animals. Uh, most animals are invertebrates. They don't have a backbone. They include mollusks, 
which would be like snails and uh, clams and things like that, annelids, which are earthworms, and then arthropods, which could include insects, spiders, that kind of stuff. Uh, they do have an apical complex, and these gregarines attach themselves to the intestinal wall here. And this is an image showing um, showing one of the of these parasites or gregarines. Uh, they're in this uh, the AP complex. So there's just a group of them. And then uh, Toxoplasma gondii. This is the entire scientific name of it. Uh, and this one is. Um, they're showing a cyst within uh, the tissues of, uh, of a host, some animal host uh, here. Uh, could be a cat, for example, some mammal host. And in there, those are little individual uh, cells of this toxoplasma uh, parasite here. Now, typically, your immune system fights it off and rids it. But if you have immunosuppression, let's say that you are an individual that had got HIV, which we talked about in the virus chapter, an HIV virus progresses to AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Now your, your immune system cannot fight it off. And this uh, parasite can go and invade other organs uh, and cause damage to those organs. So this is dangerous. Okay? The other thing is, is that this parasite can cross the placenta and get into a fetus uh, of... Uh, a human fetus, so this can affect humans. And the fetus doesn't have a well-developed immune system, so this creates uh, a situation where the, the fetus dies from this infection. So this is why it's very important, because cats can be a host for this uh, parasite here. And the cats do their business in a litter box, and the parasite comes out uh, with their feces, and if you get it on your hands, and then you wash your hands, but you don't wash them that well. And then uh, you have a sandwich, and then you ingest one. You're going to get it. And if you're expecting, you're a mom that's ex you're going to be a you're an expecting mother, uh, and the fetus is developing in you, it's bad. So doctors typically that are seeing uh, uh, women who are expecting alpha and ask, do you have a cat? And they're going to warn you about this uh, situation here. Uh, so uh, it can be very very dangerous. And then we have the ciliates. Uh, the ciliates, the, they get their name because they have the cilia here. They actually, in the laboratory, I, I have on that handout of names to know, this is the ciliophora, which uh, literally translates cilia, and then phores means to carry. So the ciliophora is the name of the phylum they belong to. Uh, there was some video showing some of these here. Uh, a common example that our representative that you should know is paramecium. And there are some others that were viewed in the lab, like Stentor, uh, which is pretty fascinating here. So uh, the little cilia beat in a coordinated fashion and allow them to move around. They're going to have an extracellular structure. It's not hard like a, like a cell wall or anything. But it's called a pellicle, kind of like I was mentioning earlier with the, the euglenas in the prior section. It's a flexible sort of a protein type of coating. Uh, so it's not very rigid, and so they allow some flexibility here. They're going to have two nuclei. They're going to have a macro uh, nucleus and a micronucleus, and a little bit will be explained in the, how these sexually reproduce here. Um, the micronucleus isn't going to be is going to be involved in, uh, and there's the genetically identical between the macro and the micro. They're carrying the same chromosomes uh, here. Uh, but it's the it's the small nucleus, the micronucleus, that's going to go through meiosis for sexual reproduction. The macronucleus runs the show, though, while the cell is not sexually reproducing. Uh, so uh, it's in charge of all the functioning there. Uh, these, these will have food vacuoles. In fact, they'll take in food uh, either with the help of their cilia or just swimming into their food, and then they'll bring the food in here and then take it in by uh, an endocytosis and then combined with a lysosome and digest. Uh, they also have contractile vacuoles uh, here and here, and these things pump actively pump out uh, water. And so um, you, can, uh, you can find videos of these uh, showing these actively pumping out the water. And so this is just a larger image here. Here's the life cycle, uh, sexual cycle of, uh, of a paramecium specifically, and the process called conjugation, kind of like um, we saw with bacteria, it's got the same name, but this, there's different. This is these are eukaryotes here. So, if we follow these two uh, individuals here, they're going to be we're going to call those two mating types. 
And so they're indicating that by coloring the nuclei different. And that way we can keep, keep track of the nucleus is the nuclei as well. Nuclei is plural for nucleus. We have a purple mating strain and a pink mating strain. In real life, these nuclei, of course, are not this color. We just color coded them so we can follow what's going on. Now, why, why might they be considered two different mating types is because there may be genetic differences. It doesn't do any good if you're genetically identical to the paramecium right near you and you go and you go through this entire process. What are you doing? You're, you're uh, reshuffling very, very similar sets of genes, right? So uh, whatever the case is, uh, there, there are probably some, still some genetic variation within there. But when they do come together, let's call them two mating types. The process is called conjugation. Okay. And so when they combine uh, and come together, like you see in this image here, the micronucleus is going to go through meiosis. Now, right now, the micronucleus is diploid. It has two sets, two full sets of chromosomes. So it's going to go through meiosis. Now, remember, just like we reviewed earlier, meiosis is two divisions. One cell, nucleus becomes two nuclei, two cells. In this case, just nuclei. We're not getting new cells, so we're just dividing the nucleus. It's still called mitosis. I mean meiosis. Two divisions are going to give us four nuclei, and they're going to be haploid. Right? And they're going to have different sets of chromosomes because of the of the independent uh, lining up of the pairs of chromosomes and then crossing over that occurs in meiosis. So each one of these nuclei in both the purple and the pink one uh, are genetically different. Okay, uh, recombinations of uh, the two sets of chromosomes. And what's going to happen is three of them are going to degenerate. They're going to uh, just uh, break down and go away, and only one stays. So you see that here in the next one there. So you see only one. Now, those two micronuclei are going to go through a mitosis. So mitosis is going to occur, but you're going to have, for the purple and for the pink one, you're going to start off with a nucleus that's haploid, and it's going to be mitosis like we studied before. You're not going to show a reduction in division. You're just going to get two identical haploid nuclei. Now, these nuclei that have that one set of chromosomes, they came from four nuclei earlier that were all genetically, had different genetic combinations uh, of the sets of genes that, they, that the original paramecium have. And so that divides and that gives you two micronuclei that are identical. And there, here's the key here now. During that conjugation, they're going to swap one of the micronuclei with each other. Okay? And so you see that's occurred right here. So each one has now one purple and one pink nucleus that came from one came from the other individual. And those two nuclei are going to fuse. So this process is kind of like fertilization. And that gives us back a micronucleus now that is diploid. Uh, and what we now have is a nucleus that has different combinations of genes. So now we have uh, individuals now that are that have genetic variation compared to the prior uh, cells that were going through this uh, conjugation. And what's going to happen here? So that new diploid micronucleus is going to go through one mitotic division and produce two micronuclei. Now notice what happens from this test step to this one. That macronucleus was just there helping to run the show, uh, translating and transcribing genes for enzymes for their metabolism. But what happens from here to here, visually, you can see they went away. That macronucleus degenerates. And you have two micronuclei. They're genetically the same. One of them ends up developing into the macronucleus, and the other one stays as a, as a silent micronucleus, which would eventually go through... Uh, process all over again of uh, meiosis and so on. So that's that's how paramecium do it. That's how they do their sexual reproduction. Okay. Other than that, they could divide by regular um, uh, uh, mitosis for uh, just having identical individuals uh, produced. Now, then we have the brown algae. And so when we go to the, the, this brown algae here, we're looking at this terminal pile. So here, this, this group here, uh, a brown algae, which uh, in the laboratory I gave you a phylum name to know. Okay? The phylum is Phaeophyta. Phaeophyta. Okay, we gotta watch. There's three uh, vowels in there, and uh, also in my mind I'll say Phaeophyta to remember how to spell it. Phyta, by the way, uh, comes from phyto, which is its origin. The root means plant. 
So um, phyto or phyta means plant. Uh, and I think it's a Greek origin there. So anytime you see phyto, like phytochemicals, comes from plants, right? So these brown algae are actually complex. They have, they're have multicellular. Remember, some protists can be multicellular. And here you see a uh, brown algae called giant kelp. Uh, it can grow uh, uh, many, many meters, tens of meters in length, 50 meters in length. Uh, they have a body. They even have uh, tissue that allows them to conduct materials back and forth, very similar to land plants, except they evolved that structure independent of land plants, right? So uh, the thing about uh, these here that's important right now is, first of all, they're photosynthetic. We mentioned earlier here, if they're photosynthetic, when we were talking about this group, remember that they got their chloroplasts by secondary endosymbiosis. This is shorthand for saying secondary, second degree, a second level of endosymbiosis here. So this means their chloroplasts have four membranes around them, right? So they're photosynthetic. Uh, and they have more pigments than just chlorophyll, which gives them a brown color. So this is interesting because they go through a complex life cycle that involves two multicellular generations. And uh, those two generations are referred to as a sporophyte and a gametophyte. And if I asked you to guess which one of those generations produces the gametes, you would be correct if you said gametophyte. The gametophyte generation produces sperm and egg. The sporophyte produces spores. Okay, That's how you remember it. Okay. Now, the kind of life cycle they go through is called haplodiplontic. And in the name there, remember haploid is one set of chromosomes, diplo, like diploid two. Basically, they're going to alternate between a plant or a, a, a body of, of this uh, algae that all the cells are diploid. Okay? And then some of those cells have to go through meiosis to get you haploid. And then you get a haploid generation. Those cells divide and differentiate and then form a body of this organism that all the cells are haploid. So it alternates between these two multicellular generations of sporophyte and a gametophyte. Now the sporophyte is going to be diploid and the gametophyte is going to be haploid. So it's diploid and haploid. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. So this is, I, I think this is a drawing of another kind of uh, a large brown algae called laminaria. It just it looks like laminaria to me. But this is the body of the plant and this right here is diploid. So every cell in this algae here um, it has a structure analogous, not homologous, to a stem, and then it has another structure that ties it to a substrate. Uh, and then here's the body here of, um, of the main body of this. Many, many cells, multicellular uh, in there. And so there's going to be some special cells here that are going to go through meiosis. And usually in special structures, they might call it sporangia, but they go through meiosis. So some cells, not all of the cells, just in certain little places, maybe there's a sporangium there, and then some cells there are specialized to go through meiosis. So we start off, the cells start off as diploid, and then they go through meiosis, and they produce these spores. Now take a look here. There's your flagella, and you can see the flagella there has those little hair-like structures, which we were talking about, the struminal pila, right? It means like straw-like or hair-like structures. These are going to be called zoospores, and they're haploid spores that are capable of swimming with their flagella, and they're haploid. And the spores basically go, and they're going to land somewhere, and then germinate. They're going to basically grow and start dividing and making more cells, and every one of those cells is going to be produced by mitosis. So you're haploid here, and then all of these nuclei that are being produced by the division are all haploid, and you end up with two bodies, they're not very big, this is not going to be a very a large multicellular generation like the, the sporophyte over here, but these are your gametophytes. This is your gametophyte generation. It's several cells, and there's uh, differences in some cells, so it's, uh, they're a uh, multicellular generation. Now, some of these are going to produce uh, gametes, and you can see here's your sperm, and here's your egg, but we're already haploid. So here's where we don't want to get confused because when it comes to human biology and animals in general, in order to get gametes, the body of the animal is diploid. In order to get sperm and egg, you've got to go through meiosis to get haploid, but the bodies of this algae are already haploid. You can't go through meiosis. So this has to be 
make mitosis in order to do that. So the cells that divide from here be, uh, are going to differentiate. So it's mitosis and differentiation. And they differentiate into sperm, and then uh, the other one produces an egg, and the egg fertilizes the sperm, and you get a zygote, and that zygote is diploid, and then it goes through division by mitosis and differentiation to give you the next generation sporophyte. Okay, so this is your sporophyte multicellular generation, and then we alternate of our gametophyte generation. So brown algae show this. And by the way, since you have two full generations that are multicellular, that's called haplodiplontic. Now, are humans and other animals haplodiplontic? No, that would be weird because if we were to be haplodiplontic, then that means the sperm and the egg cells would go through division and differentiation and form an entire uh, animal that's the cells are all haploid. And that doesn't happen. Instead, the sperm uh, and the egg never go through any divisions to produce a multicellular haploid animal generation. Instead, the sperm would fertilize the egg before you get the next generation. And that is going to be referred to as diplontic. And diplontic means you have a multicellular diploid generation. And yes, you go through meiosis, but the sperm and the egg, they don't divide any further after that. Fertilization occurs and you get diploid right away. There are others that are haplontic, other kinds of organisms, in which you have a multicellular haploid generation, and then diploid cells are produced, but for a very short time. And we might see that in some algae uh, that uh, I'll try to remember to point out to you. And in that case, that would be called haplontic life, uh, life history or life cycle. Haplon, where's my mark here? Haplontic. So that's the difference there. Right for right now, this brown algae here is haplodiplontic, two multicellular generations, one diploid, the other one the gametophyte haploid. Okay. So uh, another group that belongs to the Strominophila is the diatoms. Uh, uh, an old name that I remember learning here uh, was uh, I don't know why that appeared. That's from a different slide. Weird. Um, so um, that was from one of the diplontics that I was mentioning. The phylum Chrysophyta, okay? Um, I think in the handout in the lab, I don't even have that name given to you. It's in the notes. It says, formerly in the phylum Chrysophyta. These names change because we knew, we learned new relationships, so a name changes in order. Uh, your textbook still says phylum Chrysophyta. It may still be actually a, a good valid name in taxonomy, uh, but be aware that that one's there. Uh, I think another classification steam puts them in a heterocontophyta, which means variable flagella. Uh, but um, anyway, that doesn't take away what diatoms are. Diatoms are photosynthetic, so we could consider them as algae. They're unicellular, and they produce these tests or these shells or this extracellular matrix made of silica or silicate. So a test of silica. Test is just a name for the shell part. And it's in two pieces. One's large and the other one's smaller, kind of like a Petri dish, the two sides to it. And they have some of these amazing, amazing designs uh, that are produced by these tests. Uh, and sometimes in your lab, we have cells that just has the dead organism. And all this, all you're looking at is these, these silica shells that are really microscopic. And they have these just amazing designs. These are, these are, these are color-enhanced uh, micrographs. This is a scanning. It scans the surface so you get a three-dimensional image of these very, very tiny diatoms here. Now, they are capable of moving uh, a movement, but the movement is unusual. It doesn't involve pseudopodia, flagella, or cilia. Uh, instead, they have these grooves called raphi. And within the, inside the structure there, they have these fibrils uh, or fibers within there that seem to vibrate. Uh, fibro is just a name for like protein-like structure. And that vibration allows uh, somehow... Uh, is involved in allowing these to have some sort of locomotion. I, I got curious about that and looked up a paper once, and uh, they were trying to learn how this mechanism actually works. So there's probably still trying to figure that out, but uh, it's interesting. So these diatoms are neat. Uh, by the way, these diatoms, when they die, the, the glass shell settles to the bottom of the ocean and uh, gets becomes part of the sediment. And uh, he, us humans go and mine it, and it's called diatomaceous 
for diatome, diatomaceous earth. And basically it's the little silica shells. And they use it in industry for filtering. Uh, it's also used as a non-poisonous type of insecticide because little glass shells will cut the exoskeleton of arthropods and cause them to dry up and die from dehydrating. Uh, but that's uh, used for those diatoms. And then there's the oomycetes. Uh, oomycetes, the, the mice right there, uh, mycete. My comes from uh, Greek origin. Myco actually means fungus. And these were once considered fungi, but uh, new information suggests that that's not, that's not a good placement. So they've thrown them back with the protists. Uh, but they're referred to as water molds because of their former uh, classification. Now, some of them are going to be parasites on plants and animals, and some of them are saprobes. And what is a saprobe? That uh, You've heard of parasite before, but saprobe is going to be an organism that is going to be consuming dead organic material. Okay, So helping to break down uh, and decompose things. Uh, so some of them don't affect other organisms. Now, there are many that are important parasites, uh, and you can see, I got an image of one here that causes a disease in fish. It looks like this cottony thing. It's called cotton wool disease. And this is the organism growing out of the body of this fish. And I don't think the fish is just dead yet from it, but it probably is headed that way. Uh, but it causes a disease called saprolegniosis. Uh, and that's related to the, the genus of this uh, specific kind of... Um, of, uh, of uh, Water mold, uh, saprolegnia is the name of the genus. So the name of the disease is given based on that name. Now, what's common to these water molds is that they produce these zoospores, and we saw zoospores that were produced uh, in uh, earlier with the. Uh, we went back to the brown algae. Those were considered zoospores. Now, are zoospores produced? By meiosis, right? And these zoospores do have two flagella, like we saw with the uh, with the brown algae. You can see the two flagella there, and one of them has those little stromental piles. So this might be one of those shared derived characters we talked about in systematics. And you can see this is what the oomycete zoospore is, and those flagella are used to move uh, to a different host if this is a parasite. Uh, <clears throat> and so. Uh, this is their <laughs> zygospore that would go and then germinate. And if this was one that causes this disease here, I'm not going to try to butcher that name again, uh, but uh, if this zoospore lands on another host like another fish, then it can germinate and then grow into that uh, cotton wool disease, which is probably going to cause health problems on that. Now, there are some, typically these do live in water, but some are found on land. Uh, and... Um, there's one called uh, uh, Phytothora. Phyto means plant, right? It's not a plant, but Phytothora, because this is a, it probably has to do with something. The fact that it it uh, is uh, an infectious agent of plants. This one here, Phytothora infestans, actually was responsible for the Irish potato famine, which you probably read about or studied in history, and uh, that caused massive famine and almost half. Uh, half a million people died from starvation because in that part of the world in that time, a major part of their calorie intake came from potatoes. Today, worldwide, a major part of our caloric intake comes from wheat. So in this section, we're going to look at another uh, supergroup called the Rhizaria. And uh, one of the things about the Rhizaria, and here they are on that uh, cladogram here, there's only three groups, radiolarians, foraminiferans, and the Circozoa. Um, and uh, these are all, uh, for the most part, thought to be monophyletic uh, subgroups of the Rhizaria. Uh, and they, they all have something in common is that they, they do have pseudopods or pseudopodia, it's another way to say in the plural form, for locomotion. Um, and the, um, one of the things, one of the learning outcomes is to distinguish between radial areas and for, for an inference, I think. So we want to distinguish between the shells, which we might also call tests. These are microscopic organisms. They produce that extracellular matrix. Between the forum and infer and the diatoms were in a prior section. Uh, so I got to wonder, maybe... Uh, maybe they were talking about the radiolarians. Uh, but if we went back to the diatoms, their test is made of silica. 
So far, the radiolarians. So the radiolarians, if I were to substitute that out and put radiolarians, and that's relevant to this specific group. That doesn't mean we can't compare uh, with another supergroup, uh, the diatoms from the earlier uh, stromenopiles. Uh, but if we put radiolarians in there, then the foraminiferin, their test is made of calcium, whereas this one, uh, radiolarians, is made of glass, just like the diatoms. So uh, I just have to wonder if they intended to write radiolarians instead of diatoms. But those are the three groups. So take a look at the radiolarians. Uh, the, the key thing about this one is uh, the rhizaria have very slender, thin uh, pseudopodia. So you can see the, the pseudopodia sticking out of the test there. And the radio the radiolarians, their test is made of silica, which is glass, silicate, right? And so they have this needle-like pseudopodia. Now, your textbook refers to these as phyto. Now, remember, we, we know phyto is plant, right? So phytoplankton. Okay. And phyto means uh, they're photosynthesizing or they're plant-like. And plankton just means they're drifting along the water. They're not capable of swimming on their own. Uh, and so uh, this is the case here. They can use the pseudopodia to capture food uh, and they can use it for moving uh, along surfaces as well. They're, 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 it's not intended to use it as swimming uh, overall. So um, that's the radiolarians. Uh, then in the foraminiferans, your book also is not on the slide here, also refers to them as phytoplankton. Uh, okay. uh, and the, the thing you don't want to get fused, confused here on is that the foraminifera, this, this other subgroup, uh, they're heterotrophic, so they're not autotrophic like the radiolarians are. The radiolarians can do their photosynthesis. So uh, they do have a uh, uh, shell, but the shell is uh, calcareous. It's made of uh, calcium, right? So, um, so their test, the shell, is of uh, calcium carbonate. This is the same stuff uh, a chicken egg shell is made of, a bird egg shell. Uh, it's the same stuff chalk is made of, at least right on chalkboards. Um, uh, so these have little holes in their test, just like the radiolarians, and they have these slender pseudopodia that they also use to capture food and to, to also move as well. Uh, they do have complex life cycles, which involve both haploid and diploid generations. And when they die, they're also going to leave their own deposits, uh, like the white cliffs of Dover that are found in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is an image of those white cliffs, and that cliff there is made of these diatoms. And you're thinking, well, these things live in water. How do they end up above the water there? Well, uh, you got to remember that we have plate tectonics and other things. And when these continents are moving and colliding with each other, sometimes crust gets lifted upwards. And so uh, that may be the case here with these Dover cliffs, this part was once underwater where you had form a difference, ancient ones, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of years ago, and then uh, they die and they deposit and then uplift and then you get this uh, these rock formations. And this would be a sedimentary rock called limestone. Okay. It's made of calcium carbonate. Uh, and so that's the same image from earlier. And then we have the Circozoa and these are morphologically diverse. Uh, some of them move by pseudopodia, but others uh, do have uh, flagella. So some move by flagella, some by pseudopods. So some of them may have evolved uh, otherwise. Now, these guys are photosynthetic. They live in the soil, mo moist soil. Uh, and the evidence for their ability to do photosynthesis is that they acquired their chloroplast by a primary endosymbiosis. So when we look at, at that, we were looking at secondary endosymbiosis when it came to the brown algae. When we look at uh, primary endosymbiosis for the chloroplast, that only involves one supergroup called the archaeoplastida. And we're not in that group yet. We haven't covered it. Okay, so uh, the only other group outside of the archaeoplasta, which by the way includes the land plants like the trees we see outside, uh, green algae and red algae, the only other group that's outside the archaeoplasta that shows primary uh, or evidence of primary endosymbiosis is the circozoa. So that's an interesting uh, thing here. You, you have a different group of eukaryotes 
that acquired their own chloroplast by uh, primary endosymbiosis event. In this uh, section, we're going to look at the supergroup Archaeplastida. Uh, and a plastid is a uh, reference to the chloroplast, and archae you can do that, uh, consider as ancient. And so this group, the thing to remember about this one is this is a first degree or primary endosymbiosis. And this is primary endosymbiosis for uh, how the uh, or the origin of the chloroplast. So here you have uh, an ancient eukaryote that took in a cyanobacterium, uh, and all of the all of the uh, the chloroplast that we see in this group uh, of the archaeoplastids, which are right here, they include red algae, uh, uh, green algae, and another more advanced group of green algae. Uh, called the carophyta, and then the land plants, like the oak trees and grass that we see. They all got that by primary endosymbiosis, uh, and so they include red algae. So you're going to be looking at red algae, and then uh, how do humans use red algae, and then uh, we're going to be looking at carophytes, which are thought to be the closest relative to land plants. So the carophytes are a somewhat more uh, complex or advanced type of green algae. And then there's the land plants. And all of these can be traced back to this common ancestry back here, uh, especially with regards to this, the chloroplast uh, here. So uh, this group consists of the red algae, which uh, are in the group phylum rhodophyta, the green algae chlorophyta, and there's another phylum called Carophyta. The Carophytes is informal for Carophyta. You're only expected to know Rhodophyta and Chlorophyta in the laboratory, but in the lecture, we're going to talk about the importance of the Carophyta uh, here. So these are all photosynthetic, like I mentioned, and it was primary into symbiosis and how um, the uh, chloroplasts uh, uh, came to be in this group of organisms. So here's the rhodophyta, it's a phylum. This is the red algae group. Uh, and they do have both microscopic and uh, large uh, large organisms that can be seen with a naked eye like we see here. You can see the blades uh, from the red algae there. Um, they have some characteristics um, that may be similar to um, uh, land plants. They lack flagella. Uh, so they don't produce cells with uh, flagella. They have, uh, they don't have centrioles, which are associated with centrosomes that organize the microtubules during mitosis. Uh, they do have some special pigments that give them this reddish color, uh, and they do have some fancy names uh, like phycoerythrins is one of them mentioned in the book. Uh, and that is uh, an adaptation to being able to live in deeper water. These are accessory pigments that allow them to make use of other wavelengths of light that allow, that penetrate deeper into the water so they can live further down in the water column um, because of those extra pigments here. Uh, and it has to do, it's kind of related to why the ocean looks blue or right? the water is going to absorb certain kinds of wavelengths of light as it goes down first before others. Eventually, all of the wavelengths or colors of light that make up white light get absorbed and you get into a zone where there's no light anymore if you're deep enough. Uh, so it is a, uh, a, uh, Adaptation, right? So here we have, they do have both haploid and diploid phases, so that we would consider that for many species here, not all, but many would be haplo uh, diplontic, like we mentioned earlier. Now, they're not going to show you a specific life cycle in the book, but uh, keep be aware that some that some species, some groups within rotophyta are haplo diplontic. That's the same image. Then we go to the green algae, and they include the phylum carophyta. This is informal. It's uh, the formal name is Phylum Carophyta, right? And so the Carophyta are thought to be closely uh, the closest ancestors to land plants. Land plants are multicellular, and they include things like grasses and shrubs and trees. This is a uh, unicellular organism that is a Carophyta called Chlamydomonas, which is one you need to know from the laboratory. Uh, when we do the you do the survey of protists on algae called Chlamydomonas. Uh, and I actually have video of Chlamydomonas that's uh, here in this uh, video you're going to see playing on the right. They have two flagella and they, they move around. 
uh, and this will probably slow down. Uh, they they do they can move quite fast. So when you look at them under the microscope, you might put a, a substance on the slide where the water is that slows them down. Uh, this uh, uh, these uh, these chlorophytes, the chlorophyta, phylum chlorophyta. Uh, seem to have diverged from the group that gave rise to land plants about a billion years ago. So we're talking about going way back in time when this, this first eukaryotes uh, uh, were coming around and, uh, of course, before uh, multicellular land plants uh, evolved. Uh, and so um, the, um, there is some discussion in the book, but the main point here is uh, primary uh, endosymbiosis uh, these are uh, generally called, commonly called, the green algae. Okay. And um, there's some discussion on how that species uh, of Chlamydomonas called Chlamydomonas genus Reinhardii is a specific one that they've used in a lot of genetic studies uh, uh, and um, learning about gene expression and so on. Uh, it's it's a good side notes to, for discussion, but where uh, Chlamydomonas is a representative no for the laboratory, and in the lecture you need to know about green algae and what's significant about them. Um, primary endosymbiosis to get their chloroplasts. Uh, by the way, some of the chlorophyta are going to show simple multicellularity. This is the life cycle of that Chlamydomonas, and the Chlamydomonas does show a sexual life cycle, and they go between. Uh, diploid and haploid generations, but this is not haplodiplontic uh, by any means. Uh, you don't even have uh, multicellular anything. They're unicellular haploid and unicellular diploid here. And the thing about it is that when the gametes are produced, they look the same. They look exactly the same. So that's called iso. Iso means the same. I saw gamete. Okay. Uh, and when Two gametes that are similar combined by fertilization. Sometimes they call that syngamy, and that's basically fertilization. So they use the word fertilization here, but it would also be appropriate to say syngamy. You do see these terms in the laboratory manual when you use it to guide you through this the life cycle. The life cycle of Chlamydomonas is covered in there in the same images there. Uh, so let's take a look at this real quick. So let's say that we were looking at what we were looking at in the video just on the prior slide. The chlamydomonas is moving around, everything is going great, and uh, you're going to have mating uh, types that uh, eventually occur here. But for the most part, uh, you have different strains, their uh, population, they can divide by regular mitosis, just create more clones of themselves. Uh, and they're moving around, and they, all of the cells are the haploid. So that's basically what the population is as they exist, they're all haploid. So they go through mitosis. And then there may be coming a time where the environment becomes uh, stressful on them. And that kind of is going to get them to go through a mitosis, but not just uh, mitosis. So we go through mitosis and we create a lot more of them. Uh, they code them slightly different to get one kind of strain, a minus and a plus, just arbitrarily calling them a minus and a plus strain. And so when this population, the chlamydomonas, and these populations experience stresses, they're going to go through a division not just mitosis, but they're going to go through mitosis, and it has to be mitosis because they're already haploid. We can't cut uh, one set of chromosomes in half, otherwise you don't have a full set. So go through mitosis, and uh, remember the term from earlier, differentiation. And what they do is they differentiate to behave like gametes. And they're going to look almost exactly like the uh, vegetative cells. The vegetative cells are just divided and photosynthesizing. These are sex cells here. And so when they divide and differentiate, just by mitosis, they form gametes that are going to fuse together and combine in a process called syngamy, which is a fancy name for fertilization. So that's going to produce your diploid zygote. But notice that crusty thing around there. That's that cyst. That's that uh, a structure that's going to be on the outside. The pondro dried up, for example. When the pond starts to dry up, things get more concentrated in there. So maybe those are some cues, external stimuli that get them to do this, to go through that differentiation here. So they combine, they fertilize, the pond dries up, and now you have this uh, zygospore that's just there waiting out the bad times when things are dry. Then it rains and water builds up in the pond, and then boom, we get uh, 
this thing to become activated and it's diploid right now. The cell that's in there, so what's going to happen? It's going to go through meiosis, two cell divisions, which is why you end up with four cells when we're done with the process. One are of one mating type, one are of another mating type, and there's genetically different because of uh, recombinations of genes that occurs during meiosis. Remember that big idea, significance of meiosis is genetic recombination. And genetic recombination promotes genetic diversity. So um, some of the chlorophytes, the green algae and the phylum chlorophyta can be uh, colonial. And uh, that's exhibited in this beautiful uh, uh, group called, uh, they belong to the genus Volvox. So it's a genus and they're going to be more than one species of Volvox. And this is a colony of cells that are all shaped just like chlamydomonas. So every one of those cells has two flagella and uh, they stay attached to each other and forming this sphere. And they can go through, uh, and the sphere can contain as many as uh, 60,000 individual cells, each one with two flagella. Uh, and sometimes they divide and they uh, just by regular uh, mitosis and cytokinesis, and they produce more cells for the, uh, the parent uh, um, individual. And then they'll produce by this asexual division, they'll produce these daughter, daughter colonies inside. Eventually they burst out and the original parent dies and then those new colonies. That's asexual. But they're also capable of going through a differentiation and forming uh, some different cell types, these gametes. Uh, and in that sense, it makes them somewhat simple multicellular uh, overall, so this is uh, this is called Volvox, and it's one of the ones to know as a representative for the phylum Chlorophyta in the laboratory. Keep in mind, they also belong uh, to the supergroup Archaeplastida, which you need to know for lecture and lab. Uh, some green algae do go through an alternation of generations between haploid and diploid like this representative called Ulva. It's not one that you see in the lab. It wasn't one required to know, but this one, I, I love this one. Uh, you can actually see this is about the size they get. It looks like lettuce. In fact, it's commonly called sea lettuce, but it's only about two cell layers thick. Uh, and so this is a species of Ulva. And they alternate between haploid and diploid generations like we saw with the brown algae. So that is haplodiplontic life cycle. The thing about this one here is that you cannot tell the difference between the sporophyte and the gametophyte. They look exactly the same. They look like that. So that's different. If we go back to the brown algae, when we study plants, when they alternate between these haploid and diploid generations, the sporophyte and the gametophyte look different. Okay, so this is their the life cycle, and this is this is the diploid side. So this is the sporophyte generation, and these are the gametophyte generations. And one good question I can ask is, what are those cells that are in there? What is their ploidy? When I ask for ploidy, I'm asking, are they haploid or diploid? And uh, the ploidy for this over here, all of the cells in the body of this uh, individual is haploid. Okay, so uh, that means you, you can't go through meiosis when you're in this stage because if you do, then you get half a set. So keep that in mind. So this is, I'm, I'm going to be asking about how you interpret these life cycles. A gametophyte is haploid. All of the cells of the entire body. So anytime you divide, you can only go through mitosis. Mitosis and maybe differentiation. Because if you do meiosis, you're going to get half the set of, of well, half of one set of chromosomes. You don't have enough um, you don't have the full set to even program for the organism. So they would, would be missing half of their genetic information. All right, so that's something to remember. I'm going to keep stressing it over and over again through these lectures. And if we meet during a tutorial or whatever, I want you to interpret life cycles. Okay, so keep that in mind. So uh, here, the gametophytes, as we mentioned earlier, are going to do the same thing. They're going to produce gametes, but they're going to produce gametes by mitosis. So uh, within special areas of the body of this uh, ulva in its gametophyte generation, uh, is going to have these structures that the cells in there are going to go through special divisions that are going to divide twice 
uh, or do divide several times, sorry, not twice. They're going to divide several times and then they're going to end up producing a bunch of gametes. And it's just by mitosis and differentiation. And that differentiation basically flips on a different set of genes that makes these cells structurally and behaviorally different. And they're going to behave like gametes. The gametes look similar, so you have plus and minus strains, just like the parent looked uh, uh, the same, the, the, the body of the parent plant there, which are haploid. Uh, they're going to fuse together fertilization. That's going to give you your zygote, which is the first cell of the sporophyte generation. This cell is, uh, the zygote is going to germinate and grow into uh, an, an individual that looks exactly like the gametophyte, except all the cells are diploid there. Now, remember that the sporophyte makes spores, and spores are always going to be made in these kinds of organisms by meiosis. So within special little organ-like structures in there, which we're going to call sporangia, those spor the sporangia cells in there are going to go through meiosis. So that's going to be two cell divisions that makes four cells uh, that are now haploid. So we're going from cells that are diploid within these sporangia to cells that are haploid. Uh, those cells now, those spores, they do have flagella. They go, they land, they germinate and form the next multicellular gametophyte generation. So that's the life cycle of Ulva, the genus, which is a representative genus of the phylochlorophyta. And then we have the caraphytes. And the caraphytes, these, uh, this is a group of green algae that seems to show a little bit uh a little bit more similarity, especially when it comes to both structural features uh, and also when they compare uh, some of the molecules that you find in there associated with uh, inheritance, including DNA sequences and the ribosomal RNA. And when they compare those, this group is more similar to land plants than it is to uh, the algae. In other words, this group, uh, the caraphytes, which is the phylum caraphyta, this is informal to end that way. So the phylum uh, caraphyta uh, share a common ancestor with land plants, a more recent common ancestor with them. And that's the way you interpret it. And there's uh, um, some analysis. There's subgroups within this uh, phylum here, uh, and they include members called Cara and Coleochaete, Coleochaeta, uh, and that's discussed here. The uh, Caraphyta belong to an order called Chirales and then the Coleochaetales. These are two competing groups for which one may be the candidate for sharing the most recent common answers. So these are just subgroups of the Caraphyta. Uh, and the thing about these guys here is they're always found right near the shore, just in the water. It's almost as if they're trying to come out of the water and move on to land, uh, just like a common ancestor uh, uh uh, uh, or, or that shows some of that. So you go back in time, you have the common ancestor where uh, they gave rise to these and they're still living and successful today. And then others just eased up on land. Maybe they got washed up on shore and they have some characteristic that allowed them to survive just a little bit of time on land and continue their life cycle there. And, uh, this section is uh, covering the amoebozoa and... Um, the, you can see the uh, video there on the bottom showing uh, an amoeba moving by pseudopodia and then using those pseudopods to wrap around uh, a ciliate, which we covered earlier. They have the, the cilia and ingesting it and making a food vacuole there in the middle. Uh, so eventually it's going to digest down that uh, other microorganism. So uh, this highlights a key characteristic of uh, our Amoebozoa. So this is a supergroup. This is where we're at on that uh, that cladogram that shows the the connection. So you can see Amoebozoa back down here, a proposed common ancestor associated with that last supergroup. So you need to be able to explain how amoebas move. That's covered here on this uh, a particular slide, and that video was uh, showing this. And then we need to be able to distinguish between plasmodial slime molds. Uh, and cellular slime molds. Now, plasmodial slime molds is not the same as the genus Plasmodium that causes malaria. That's a different group. The Plasmodium uh, 
uh, also describes a, uh, a large mass of uh, cytoplasm with a lot of nuclei in there. Uh, and so it's a different context, and the name Plasmodium means something different uh, there than the, the name of a genus, of the parasite that causes malaria. So uh, amoebas move by means of pseudopods. It's also correct to say pseudopodia uh, is probably more of a, a following Latin rules for pluralizing uh, terms. Uh, so the pseudopods, basically, as uh, the it looks like the insides of the cell are being moved, in, and that's indeed the case. These pseudopodia are projections of the cytoplasm. Uh, they move and reach forward with their cytoplasm and then bring the rest of the, the cell with it from behind. And those pseudopodia can be used to take in food by phagocytosis. So phagocytosis uh, is a prize... Uh, is a type of endocytosis. Uh, so uh, what what has to happen in there? Well, these cells need to arrange their their cytoskeleton inside. So uh, we're talking about uh, the action of uh, microfilaments, which are made of actin, and uh, even uh, another kind of protein called myosin, which uh, includes. Uh, uh, which is a kind of protein found in your muscles that help uh, contract muscles. So these are some of the proteins that are involved in helping to move that cytoplasm around, which ultimately uh, changes the shape of those pseudopods. Uh, so the amoebozoa, we, we mentioned there over here on that cladogram and the connection between our closer closer tie. And remember, you're going way back in time going this way here. But there's this last group, Opistocanto, where we belong uh, with uh, with others. So uh, there are amoebas that are free living. Uh, and I had another video there on the bottom showing the movement of the pseudopodia there. Uh, some are uh, found in soil and in fresh water. And some are parasitic. So this is a, a free living one. And it's a typical species you see in the lab called amoeba proteus. Uh, and while we can generally call them amoeba, there's an actual genus called amoeba and a species called amoeba proteus. Uh, there's your specific epithet. Remember when you write the last part of the scientific name, it's not capitalized, but they both should be underlined. Uh, there are some others that, when they get into your system, can cause disease. One belongs to the genus Acanthamoeba, uh, and that can pass uh, through a wound or even cross the mucosa up in your uh, nasal cavity and then cross the, cross the blood, blood brain barrier. Uh, and then cause inflammation in there that ultimately leads to the death of the individual. And as far as I know, for some of these uh, types, there's there's uh, not much they can do. There's another one that causes uh, amoebic dysentery, which is uh, bleeding and diarrhea. Uh, so it's a parasite of the intestine. It's called, uh, it belongs to a genus called entamoeba. Uh, and then we have the plasmodial slime molds. This one was covered in the laboratory and had a really cool video of two different species of plasmodia on a petri dish growing, and it was time lapse, and they're moving towards each other. Uh, and the thing about these is that they live as a large mass, much like you see here. This is actually one large, you can think of it as like one large uh, bag of cytoplasm that's capable of moving uh, around, and there's multiple nuclei within there, and they call that mass a plasmodium. So it can move along the forest floor. And as it does, it's feeding on things, uh, dead organic material, bacteria, uh, whatever it can get uh, get uh, into and then take in and, and break down and use as a food source. There, it's heterotrophic, right? Now, when uh, the environment becomes stressful, maybe there's no food or the environment is uh, drier than it would be more comfortable for this species, uh, they do end up forming these structures here. The body or the plasmodium dries up a bit, and they form these stalks here, which we might refer to as sporangiophores. Uh, to for East means to carry. So what they're carrying are spores up here on the top, and it's within there that uh, haploid spores would be produced, and they're being raised up into the air so that when the spores are released, the wind can carry the spores elsewhere. Uh, so they can go land maybe somewhere else that's more favorable. So these are the plasmodial slime molds. They're in the group of Mubazoa. And then the cellular slime molds, well, they get their name because they exist as uh, independent cells uh, that have this amoeboid motion. So they move very much like uh, amoebas do. Uh, and 
um, they uh, move around and they can move around, say, the soil ingesting bacteria, much like the larger plasmodial slime molds. Now, when the environment becomes stressful for them, the individual cells can actually come together, aggregate to form a larger structure uh, that's going to be referred to as a slug, and I'll show you that here. And then it's the slug that's going to produce a, 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 spor a sporangia that produces spore cells that can be released. So in the next slide here, you can see that uh, here is, uh, at this in this image right here, the first one, you already have several cells that have aggregated together. This is a species, by the way, of cellular slime mold uh, called Dictyostelium discoidium. And here, uh, the cells have come together and they're going to stop moving around uh, overall. So individual cells have come together. Uh, and then they begin to form this slug right here. And then it's from this slug that the structure starts to grow from there, develop, uh, that eventually turns into that stalk which is carrying the sporangium up here where spores would be released from uh, by wind. Uh, so uh, the fact that they move around as individual cells like amoebas do it is one of, the, one, of the, one of the characteristics that helps place them in the uh, supergroup amoebazoa. In this last section of the uh, chapter on the protists, we're going to be looking at uh, the opistocanta. Now, opisto uh, or opus means uh, um, means to the rear, to the back, or toward the rear or posterior, and kanta means a pole or like an oar for a rowboat, and so opisto kanta means uh, posterior uh, pole or oar. And this is a reference to the fact that uh, members in this group all have a flagella that's on the posterior side. When we say a flagella on the posterior side of the cell, that means that the flagella pushes rather than pulls the cell through the fluid medium here. And the only group we're going to look at are the coenoflagellates, which are protists, because this is on protista. But this group, opistocanta, includes fungi in the animals. And we know animals have produced a cell, the males do for when the sperm are produced. Uh, the fungi, there's uh, uh, some uh, uh, species, uh, groups that within the fungi that still have flagella, they still produce flagella and not all of them do. And uh, But when you look at the, the molecular uh, comparisons, there's a more close relationship with the other opistocons, which is why they are proposed to share a common ancestor uh, at some point back uh, in the past. Uh, and then the coanoflagellites share a more recent common ancestor with the animalia. So all we're going to do is actually cover the coanoflagellates and should discuss their significance in terms of how they are connected to the animalia, which includes our group uh, that humans belong to. Uh, here you can see a, uh, a coanoflagellate. This is an individual cell. And it gets its name because you have a cell body here, and then you have these little fringe-like extensions. Uh, they're almost like microvilli, and they extend outward. Uh, and that's called a collar. And uh, that's what gives it its name because a coanos means collar. Uh, so they're uh, sometimes called collar cells. And there's your flagella okay, uh, on there. So this is where they get their name now. The connection here is that some of the simplest animals uh, that we see called sponges, they have cells called coanocytes. That's not the same as a coanoflagellate. This is a special differentiated cell that has this same structure. It's got, a, it's got the cell body, it's got a collar, it's got this flagella, and those cells are lining the inside of the sponge and the flagella move, but the cell doesn't move. It's, it's within the body of the sponge. And the moving flagella creates a water current, which passes water through the body of the sponge where they can filter feed. Uh, so there's that connection there for them. And so um, I found this uh, video of some recent research where they discovered a colonial coanoflagellate, and you can see there in the image there. And this one has a behavior. The cells are communicating, and they change shape regularly in a coordinated fashion between a 
uh, sort of a ball-like structure and a cup-like structure. In the ball, they're thought to move. There you can see it move to a cup-like structure. In the ball, it moves, uh, is thought to be more for locomotion for the body of the, of the colony of uh, coinoflagellates. When it goes into that cup-like structure, it's thought to be used for feeding, according to the little summary I read on the, on the research on this. You know, it was a recent uh, discovery uh, species of coinoflagellate. Uh, now, these guys, the coinoflagellates, are thought to share a more recent common ancestor with sponges, which are simple animals. Um, and I already mentioned uh, the, the cell, the, that's the, the, st the structure of the cell with the collar uh, overall. Uh, that collar is used to help capture food. Uh, so uh, here is a, another a picture from your, your book showing an image of a, uh, um, of a coano, um, um, a coano uh, uh, flagellate. So it's a colonial one. Uh, and... Uh, the, uh, like I said, the, uh, the cells resemble uh, structurally the, that of a sponge. And I thought this was kind of funny. I found this online. Uh, this is an actual sponge. It's a, a form of sponge. Uh, they have certain forms or types of sponges called a barrel sponge. You can see why it looks like a barrel in there. And basically the, coan the coanocytes line the inside of uh, the cavity that's in there and they're beating water. And then uh, the sponges belong to a group called periphera because their body wall has little pores there. So water is taken in to in through the, the wall of there and then water comes out uh, this opening here. So we'll study that later. I thought it was funny because I, I found this and they the superimposed SpongeBob SquarePants face on there. Uh, but sponges don't have, they're very simple animals. They don't have organs like eyes and um, a digestive system overall. They're multicellular, very, very simple animal type. Uh, but the connection between the coanoflagellates and the coanocytes and other things tie them together and put them uh, pretty, pretty near uh, or share recent ancestry with animals and especially with the sponges. So here's our common ancestor here to the animals.